Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Factor Review, a weekly roundup of the biggest story shaping Mongolia. Here with us tonight is our guest commenter and columnist at Trend, Ms. Botrishten. Thank you. Thank you for having me yeah. in your program. And my name is Dutgal. We're live on Facebook every television and we want to hear your thoughts, so send us your comments on Twitter with hashtag Jargat underscore de facto. Coming up on the program. On October 1st, the fall session of the parliament opened. Should there be a presidential or parliamentary form of government? The Asia Foundation released a study of corruption in the education sector. So this past week, the parliament's opening was, uh, fall session was opened. And during it, the Speaker of um, Parliament, Iqbal, pointed out a couple of legal reforms that are going to be made in the current constitutional framework, as well as improving the business environment and issues concerning the education and health sectors. Um, so why haven't there been, been any irregular parliamentary sessions lately? Well, speaking of um, the irre irre irregular irregular. parliamentary session, we have to get back to Mr. Ayurdin's mm -hmm. uh, politics in which his attempt to have the parliamentary session held during the summer holiday. Mm -hmm. And he insisted from uh, Speaker Inhold uh, to hold the parliamentary session to help more lights, shed more lights on the popular 60 billion Tobruk mm -hmm. bribery case. Mm -hmm. And I think, but from my point of view, uh, after all this was not about fighting with corruption, mm -hmm. uh, seriousness and death of which was actually undermined and downplayed by that popular 60 billion mm -hmm. uh, to work bribe case. Mm -hmm. This has, was, I think, more about gaining bargaining power, favor, and uh, power in favor of Mr. Hurusuk's mm -hmm. political position and authority, who is mm -hmm. the current prime minister and the head of the MPP. Mm -hmm. And it appeared that in the end, Mr. Ayun Irten, um ended his campaign without substantial outcomes on fighting with corruption. Um, but showed us some documents and papers uh, showing us that there is some mutual understanding and agreements between Mr. Speaker and mm -hmm. him. So I think the absence of regular parliamentary sessions and stability of the government, current government, mm -hmm. and the understandings and negotiations inside the political party, leading mm -hmm. party, is interrelated. That's all we can hope for at least. Mm -hmm. And what do you think were some of the notable matters that was discussed during this opening session of Parliament? Well, first of all, enforcing the state and government functions, mm -hmm. and second of all, improving the business climate, mm -hmm. and for taking better care of education and healthcare system, and fourth, uh, screening and evaluation of law implementation. Mm -hmm. These are the four main directions the speaker uh, addressed in, the, in his opening remarks. But isn't it this little bit too familiar or mm -hmm. you know, same old stories they keep telling us uh, mm -hmm. in the every opening or every end of this, every session, you know, yeah. season. So I believe that given the fact that only one year and a half remained until next general election, mm -hmm. all that matters for MPP is now to act the mm -hmm. action. Uh, I think the public comes to where no longer this sort of sugar-coated stories mm -hmm. and this uh, romantic uh, you know, promises mm -hmm. is no longer attractive. Uh, so they wouldn't buy it anymore. Mm -hmm. and so I think when it comes to policy matters, uh, you can no longer fake or you can no longer tell just these attractive things mm -hmm. and tell lies. And I think there are some but there are really important legal bills on the list. Mm -hmm. And there were mentions of making a couple of legal reforms as you just mentioned. So what are some of these legal reforms that they are planning or saying they're promising? Well, actually we, um, by now, we all heard mm -hmm. that our Mr. President actually said a thank you to our constitutions mm -hmm. and those who actually you know, made it, created it. Yeah. And it's time to move on and make some system changes or reforms, that's mm -hmm. what he said. 
and including his intention in politics. I do believe that the main agenda of this, in, you know, this parliamentary session will surely be the constitutional revision mm -hmm. uh, without hesitation. Mm -hmm. But what did Mr. You know, President uh, mean mm -hmm. by system or by reform? Yeah. Yeah, what do you think? And the public discussion regarding this important question already started and some people actually raised concerns about moving backwards from mm -hmm. parliamentary systems to, um, I don't know, mm -hmm. what kind of change is going yeah. to take place. This is, the, I think, the most important question we have to put in mind in this mm -hmm. session. And um, I would like to say that Constitution is the cornerstone of this, you know, founding mm -hmm. stone of this society we are now mm -hmm. all we are yeah. standing. So this doesn't only belong to politics. Mm -hmm. It belongs to your family, it belongs to you and me. Mm -hmm. So we really have to, uh, all of us, including research mm -hmm. and civil society and media and um, policy makers, of course, we really should keep talking and discussing to move forward mm -hmm. um, regarding this, you know, extremely important yeah. uh, policy matter. Mm -hmm. And mm, of course, besides uh, constitutional revision, besides that, uh, law droughts on election system, mm -hmm. which also has to do with uh, constitutions yeah. and political parties, law about political parties, and presidency, of course, are on the list. Mm -hmm. And we really should be uh, mindful and observant about all these legal changes which are planned to take place during this session. Um, since these are really the roots, I think, the roots of all the social problems we are facing these days. Mm -hmm. And um, with related to economy, I think there are also extremely important legal bills yeah. uh, on a queue, uh, including corporate tax law mm -hmm. and individual income tax law mm -hmm. and of course the investment banking law not mm -hmm. to mention. So I think this, um, this parliament is I think actually quite productive mm -hmm. given the statistics it's quite productive and speedy and uh, it has this rhythm you know to yeah. produce law so we have to closely follow them. Yeah. And as you said, there's a number of things on the agenda they're trying to fulfill during this uh, parliament century. So how successful do you think they will be able to in discussing and uh, reaching a decision on all of these matters? Uh, mm -hmm. I personally, I think the answer to that question really depends on whether the Mongolian People's Party, mm -hmm. the leading party, is now holding the 64 seats in the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, would run its policy as a united single party. Mm -hmm. And they have every power and they have every button in their hands uh, to enact every law proposed if they want. Mm -hmm. and, but um, it's now has, it now has become common knowledge that there were two factions, to name it like 42 and 43 mm -hmm. factions uh, and so on. And, but given the resignation of Mr. Kantosla, the former parliament member, mm -hmm. now the number has equal to 32, mm -hmm. uh, against 32. Yeah. But uh, now since one part led by Mr. Hurilsuk mm -hmm. is now holding the power, I think the key to the mutual understanding actually lies in the hand of the Mr. Speaker or the 32 mm -hmm. factions. And actually the Prime Minister Hurilsuk a few days ago, he mentioned that uh, there is no, now no longer this sort of two factions of 32 or 32 inside the party. Mm -hmm. Now we are one party and we are going to uh, continue the, uh, the policy we promo you know, promised mm -hmm. during the election. So yeah. I hope if uh, what he says is true, uh, yeah. let's hope that yeah. <laughs> if, uh, what he says is true, that increases the uh, possibility of bringing this serious legal mm -hmm. reforms and changes to the life. Mm -hmm. and, but we have to, of course, uh, think about worst case scenario also. Mm -hmm. mm, that would be, of course, the leading party MPP will still be divided. Mm -hmm. And the former cabinet members 
you know, a former cabinet members who were resigned with Mr. Ertenbat mm -hmm. would still want to get back on the wings. So that would make uh, that would make space for the opposition party to make their dance. You know, yeah. that that would be, I think, the um, will bring some serious stagnations and misunderstanding or controversies to the politics of this autumn. Mm -hmm. And also during the promise uh, session, as you just mentioned, um, President Batotok stated that there needs to be a couple of systemic reforms made, like in the constitutional law. So, do you think that the fact that Patota, um, President Batotok is calling for these reforms is a like a overreach of power? Because currently, our legal power, legislative power, is in the parliament, not in the gov uh, in the presidents. Well. Um Speaking of, of reaching powers, we have to take a look into the laws, you know, mm -hmm. a law dictates and if we take a look into the law about uh, regarding presidency and president, he is entitled to draft and submit a law to the parliament mm -hmm. first. And second of all, in accordance with law again, uh, he is entitled to bring serious issues Mm -hmm. to the parliaments concerning foreign and domestic policies. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is not that he actually overreached his power uh, bringing this issue to the uh, public concern, but more important question is that, uh, like I mentioned before, what he meant by system, also mm -hmm. by reforms or amendments and changes. And more important, or the most important question is, what we, you know, wish. Yeah. W what is our will and this, you know, all these uh, mm -hmm. system, system reforms, or what is our own vision? Mm -hmm. So I think we really have to, uh, you know, express w our opinions, deliver our will when all these issues are on the table. Mm -hmm. And also, it was also discussed that during the additional, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's going to be reforms of additional laws on consumer in, on corporate income mm -hmm. as well as investment banking. So, how do you think these laws, ref law reforms, will be progress? The progress. Uh, the difficulty of answering that question actually lies in the, you know, inside the party politics, like we talked. Mm -hmm. uh, in a previous session. I, I really think the answer to that question uh, has to do with how it is MPP mm -hmm. uh, brings this, all these issues on the table about this party's um, organizational change and I don't know what kind of issues are they are carrying but I really think uh, if they uh, act like United Party mm -hmm. they have you know 64 seats Mm -hmm. If they have consensus and understanding amongst the, inside the party, uh, I think the, the speed and the productivity of bringing these laws into their life will be higher. Mm -hmm. But, um, like I said before, if Mr. Hursu really meant that now the party has solved this, uh, this division issues, mm -hmm. um, I think the politics playing against the opposition party will not be the big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, I think, depends on his leadership inside his own party and his position against the opposition party. Mm -hmm. And as a columnist um, who um, addressed the, the public readers, mm -hmm. uh, whatever I'm writing, I'm trying to tell uh, the readers is that we really uh, need to have more uh, positive and affirmative uh, will delivery mm -hmm. yeah. to this, this, all this process and um, in the whole process and too much time and too much opportunities I think are passing behind us when we are you know complaining about what is not, not good mm -hmm. for us so we have to really start telling them that what is good for us actually mm -hmm. what we want so I think this will speed up or this will uh, actually influence them yeah. in what, what, what way they are, you know, mm -hmm. approaching all these issues they, are, they have. Mm -hmm. 
And previously you mentioned there that there was a little bit of a dispute about like what kind of system should we should we evolve back to our old system. So there are two types of the presidential and parliament system of government. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of either one? Well, I think both uh, has its you know weakness and its strong points. Mm -hmm. And I think first we have to explain the difference between the two. And the state or government is this apparatus or institution where policy is made, mm -hmm. and this policy must be exercised, you know, it must be executed. So the main difference between presidential system, democracy, and parliamentary mm -hmm. democracy is that who executes that policy? Yeah. And in a parliamentary democracy, people elect the own representatives, mm -hmm. and the winning party, uh, well, constitutes the parliament, and the parliament elects, uh, well, nominates own prime minister, and the mm -hmm. prime minister uh, forms own cabinet, right? Mm -hmm. So the uh, prime minister becomes the uh, main one in charge mm -hmm. to execute the policies. Uh, in the presidential system, people elect the president themselves, and the, uh, like Mr. Donald Trump, yeah. the president uh, forms own cabinet, Mm -hmm. And uh, he becomes the uh, main yeah. uh, main charge in, in the execution policy mm -hmm. executive. And but our country's case is quite specific. You know, mm -hmm. we uh, we are we, we employed this parliamentary system. We uh, elect people. Mm -hmm. They form the cabinets. Yeah. So we have prime minister. But we also uh, choose president. president from public, mm -hmm. and the president also has own cabinets, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't have this executive, you know, uh, functions. Mm -hmm. But it, it really is mixed. Mm -hmm. And I uh, sort of did some research and, like, giving some 60 countries of parliamentary e democracy system, mm -hmm. there are only four countries that. That's this both kind of this two-headed, uh, uh, mm -hmm. mm, well, political system. Yeah. So I think now the main question regarding all this constitutional revision and so on is, is asking from us that which direction you want to follow, mm -hmm. whether this classic, uh, strong, uh, prime minister and cabinet, like state or government, mm -hmm. whether you would like to choose the presidential system. Mm -hmm. So and I, so I would add yeah. one more thing. Um, the bo bottom line of all of this is that, you know, since the uh, in the parliamentary democratic system, since the parliament elects its own prime minister and the cabinet, mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit less friction uh, between the uh, uh, legal system, legislation mm -hmm. system, and the executive branch. Mm -hmm. and in the presidential system, the president has its own power. Mm -hmm. uh, he directly communicates with the people. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, given that it, it has more check and balance between powers yeah. uh, compared to the parliamentary system. And so I think the latter has more speed. Mm -hmm. It has more um, well, harmony. Mm -hmm. compared to the uh, presidential system. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of system do you think is more suitable for Mongolia itself? If it's allowed to uh, share my personal opinion, mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, I firmly believe that we should uh, without surely proceed to enforcing the parliamentary um, democratic system. Mm -hmm. uh, I would give you three reasons behind that. Uh, first of all, given this relatively young age of democracy mm -hmm. and free market economy, uh, populism is still alive. You know, mm -hmm. populism is still young. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's strong. Yeah. It plays. It prevails. So, what if we, what if we choose the presidential system and it ends up we choosing somebody super populist, mm -hmm. and all these uh, policy matters and policy executive falls into somebody's, somebody's populist's hand. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we cannot have that you know, in, in this coming, coming age. And second of all, um, I would like to remind you this case about Mongolia becoming a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization mm -hmm. like two months ago. I don't know where that comes from, who proposed that, mm -hmm. but it is true that some serious politicians brought that topic to the table. Mm -hmm. And public opinion really mattered during that time and some parliament members also expressed their opinion. Mm -hmm. So given this our geographic or geopolitical position sandwiched between these two big neighbors, mm -hmm. um, I think the parliament is really the immunity of this public will and democracy when if, if in case mm -hmm. Uh, some sort of pressure or some sort of domestic policies intervention comes from these neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, third reason is I, that I mentioned before, the speed. Mm -hmm. We need speed rather than this too much check, you know, too much yeah. check in uh, balance between powers. We mm -hmm. had that enough, I think, for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so moving on to our third topic of the night was that the Asia Foundation recently mm -hmm. released a study on corruption and ethical misconduct in the education sector of Ulaanbaatar and for AMX. So the survey was used to assess uh, respondents' perception as well as understanding of ethics, transparency and corruption uh, in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So what were your thoughts on this survey by the Asia Foundation? Um, uh, to be honest, for the time being, um, yeah. I'm not really well informed about the results of the mm -hmm. survey they conducted. But um, I do have some understandings and some studies in my own hands. Mm -hmm. And I think really it's very important to, f first of all, generally speaking, measure any kind of corruption and misconducts. Because only by measuring uh, for the first time it becomes possible to understand the depths of seriousness of the issue. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the problems spoken only by mouths or by words mm -hmm. becomes the, the official you know, problem on the table. So I think um, what Asia Foundation and other institutional research uh, are doing is really important. And um, what we have to do is from now on to tackle with the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so what do you think are the main causes of corruption based on your research about other corruption uh, surveys and studies done? Mm -hmm. um, whomever well, closely following what I write these yeah. days would understand that my message to this kind of problems is that we really have to how understand how powerful the market is, mm -hmm. the market or demand or the necessity or the life is. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is what I try to tell all the time when writing columns and addressing the public readers. Mm -hmm. uh, the market demand, when it's not met by proper supply, mm -hmm. it always finds its ways. Yeah. Either by corrupt, corruption, either by bribing somebody, mm -hmm. or by Berkeley or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, all this, um, especially in the education sector, all these corruption issues and misconduct shows us that there's this high, you know, there's so much necessity and demands mm -hmm. about like uh, um, quality education, mm -hmm. but we are not supplying that. Yeah. So the demand finds its way, you know, to bribe you or uh, somebody mm -hmm. to let their own children have this, uh, have good education in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So the main question is, why is there, you know, is there this sort of so much corruption in the industry should be replaced by the question that where is the supply distorted? Mm -hmm. where, why, why we cannot supply good education to anybody so that anyone shouldn't be bribing and spending their money to mm -hmm. something like that? Mm -hmm. So I think there are two uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, to put it shortly, first of all, this is, this has come, this has to do with bad city planning mm -hmm. and regional developments. Mm -hmm. If the region is, you know, has own industries, if region has revenues, if it has budgets to build good schools and, you know, 
then they, they don't have to, you know, so many people in Muslim are trying to find good school, you know, mm -hmm. trying to like, like, like bribe anybody. Mm -hmm. And second reason is the budget that should be spent on providing good schools and healthcare system is mm -hmm. robbed. So uh, there's this mismatch, serious mismatch between people's want, you know, will to to like let their children have modern education mm -hmm. and the public education system. So it really all comes back to fiscal policies and getting rid of all this corruption and unfair things. Mm -hmm. And so in recent years, a number of corruption cases involving public officials have been made public. Is this a sign that the IAAC is doing their job properly? W well, uh, um, I, I do believe that they are uh, doing some decent jobs mm -hmm. fighting against corruption. Yeah. And this uh, comes back to our previous question. What IAAC is trying to do is when already the damage is done, mm -hmm. when already the market demand is not met by supplies, mm -hmm. when already the dem you know, supply is distorted, mm -hmm. so the life takes its own course, mm -hmm. so the bribery takes place, then mm -hmm. IAAC comes, you know, <laughs> comes in. So mm, I don't believe that, you know, they have to keep doing this, uh, uh, like, post event, you know. Mm -hmm. After the event takes place, you have to, even though you have to clean the mess, mm -hmm. I think this is really important. But, but prior to all of this, I, I do believe that we really have to take care of the uh, life and what we respond to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, without that, I think we will ever be fighting, we will ever be uh, entangled with all these messy issues and negativity and misunderstanding and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And finally, what do you think is the best way to combat corruption? Combat corruption? Yeah. Mm. Again and again, let the market do its job mm -hmm. again. Um, if you uh, rob the job from market, if you rob too much tax from the market, mm -hmm. then it uh, always finds its way to its corruption. Mm -hmm. So. This is like, this is really ironic. We rob the markets, we rob the jobs, we rob the opportunities for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. by imposing taxes and uh, social insurances and so on, so much uh, government regulations and so on. So the uh, market is distorted. On the other hand, uh, given that distortion, the corruption enlarges, then we keep fighting with, you know, with that uh, the remaining little resource, we keep fighting mm -hmm. with corruption. So I, I, I really think we need to get back to the beginning of all of this. Mm -hmm. Instead of instead instead of um, instead of spending so much energy and time and consciousness, we have you know we don't have much resources mm -hmm. to fight with this monster you know we we created. Mm -hmm. So I really think we should feed in that f at the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us this week. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for this week's De Facto Review. Please join us next week at the same time for another weekly roundup of the biggest stories shaping Mongolia. Good night. <laughs>